online right now. We're glad that you are here. Uh, you missed some great worship this morning uh, if you weren't here in person, but I know we're, uh, we're broadcasting really all over the world, so some, the uh, miracle of technology, so we're glad that you're here. Uh, before Donna prays, though, I do want to share a couple of announcements. Um, one is here for just uh, us locally. Our monthly Wednesday morning prayer time is this coming Wednesday at 10 o'clock here at the church. Uh, so I really want to encourage everybody who can. I know a lot of people can't do that for work and other situations, but if you can make it, we really would uh, love to have you. We've had some really powerful times as we pray into God's eternal purpose and into issues affecting our nation and the world. And, and you know, certainly there's a lot of need for uh, prayer right now and so many issues. So anyway, that's this Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, we go from about 10 until 12. Uh, and then the second announcement is really for us here locally, plus really anyone who uh, has a heart to train the, the church in, in this hour. Uh, you know we um, are doing a campaign right now to, uh, to fund the purchase of some laptops for our mentors in Africa, uh, a 30-day campaign that will run through roughly the middle of March. Uh, and we're, uh, we're trying to raise the, the funds to purchase about 25 laptops uh, for these, and we're probably about 40% of the way uh, there. We've set a budget of about $600 per laptop. Uh, and the reason for it, uh, especially those of you that are part of the Forerunner School, uh, we have been doing that now for into our second year or so of doing that. Uh, and we do it predominantly online uh, with uh, notes, videos, and audios, and then Zoom discussion groups uh, that meet once a month or so. And we're, God is really blessing it in a lot of ways and really drawing us together as a, uh, as a global church, really. Uh, but one of the issues that the African church faces, the mentors of our Life School program, is that uh, the, the technology is not sufficient there uh, for them to be able to connect online like really much of the rest of the world uh, can do. So our plan is to take all the audios, videos, and notes uh, that those that are doing it online have access to through the Internet to uh, take those, put them on a flash drive, and... Uh, ship them to Africa so that the, the mentors can uh, put them on laptops and join that so that we can disciple them as forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Those that have had an opportunity to connect with them a little bit really understand uh, the heart that these men and women of God have for, for the Lord, but they don't have the resources to be trained like the majority of us do. So, Anyway, we're trying to do that. 100% uh, of anything that's given will go toward that project. Uh, and so $600, we believe, will buy a, uh, a laptop uh, that we can use to, to do this. So if you would like to give, and I hope you will, you can give online at lifeschoolinternational.org and just go into the Give tab and uh, it'll lead you to, to uh, a campaign there that you can give to. So lifeschoolinternational.org, or you can give at our church website, restorationlife.org uh, uh, as well. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way and uh, write a check or whatever. So anyway, we would love for you to, to be, participate with that in us. It's really on our hearts to train these men and women of God that they might become part of that forerunner company that God is raising up in this hour. So... Uh, you know, one scripture verse the Lord always gives to me when, it, when I'm challenged in giving is that to whom much has been given, much is required. Uh, and so uh, I just want to challenge you to do that. Um, okay, so now let's go into the transition to the message. Here's my bride, the bride. <laughs> We're going to be talking about the bride being made ready, and okay. here she is already ready. <laughs> I just want to be ready for the main one. <laughs> yeah. Did you turn it on here? Yeah, it's, yeah, on. it's on. Yeah, okay. I thought you were turning it on. Okay. okay. Father, it's not. It is. It is. Father, we thank you for 
what you're doing in this hour, Lord. We do thank you that you are awakening your bride. And Lord, I just even thank you for the word today, that it will be a trumpet call. It will be a trumpet blast that will be going forth. Lord God, it will be an alarm awakening, oh God, for the bride to arise and shine and Lord, to really be wise about the day and the hour that we are in, to take heed to getting ready, just as we were singing and and about dining, opening the door and dining with you so that we can be prepared to dine with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, that's our heart's desire is to be made ready, oh God, for that glorious day. And we just bow our hearts before you and we just ask that you come today to us. We cry out that you come and you give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation that you reveal Jesus to us as the bridegroom king today, Lord God, that our, our, we would truly have ears to hear in the spirit, not just with our natural Lord God, that we would have the wisdom and the understanding that you say to acquire a wisdom and understanding, and I pray that we would, oh God, that you would truly give us an ear to hear what you were saying. And we just thank you and pray that your word would go forth through Ken, that you would just bypass his mind and his soul, Lord, that you would just speak not by power nor by might, but by the spirit of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'll just leave it up here. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to share a message uh, today. Uh, I've entitled it uh, Entering Into the Plan of the Ages. Enter, entering Into the Plan of the Ages. And really, I have two objectives uh, today with this message. One is this message is, I believe, a prophetic uh, invitation to the global church. It's certainly to those that are gathered here uh, here live, but it's also, uh, I, I believe, an invitation to the global church, those that are watching online and those that will be part of our Forerunner School and are part of our Forerunner School and will uh, watch this uh, at, a, at a later time. It's a prophetic invitation, uh, I believe, to enter into the plan of the ages. Uh, but I'm also having another objective with it. This is also session two of our uh, a forerunner school class called uh, A Theology of the Bride. Uh, and so we just started that, and uh, session one actually will go out uh, next week, and then this will be the, the video and the audio for session two. For those that are doing the forerunner school, I really want to encourage you not only to watch this video, though, but also to go through the notes because there probably be a lot of information in the notes that I don't get to cover uh, today. So I have two objectives. One is uh, a prophetic invitation, I believe, uh, from the Lord to enter into this plan of the ages, uh, as well as to teach, do some teaching on the, the process, the bridal preparation process, drawing from some of the ancient Jewish uh, uh, processes in terms of an, a marriage uh, in, in those days. But let me just start out. I want to start out by reading a, a quote. It's one of my favorite quotes uh, from Paul Bilheimer, who uh, wrote a, a book called Destined for the Throne. And this, this quote from it is just really so powerful. Uh, let me just read it. It is it being the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ is one thing and one alone, the eternal companion of Jesus Christ, holy God and holy man, the final and ultimate outcome and goal of events from eternity to eternity, the finished product of all the ages is the spotless bride of Christ united with him in wedded bliss at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And seated with her heavenly bridegroom upon the throne of the universe, ruling and reigning with him over an ever-increasing and expanding kingdom. He entered the stream of human history for this one purpose, to claim his beloved. Creation has no other aim. Hear that. Creation has no other aim. History has no other goal. 
from before the foundation of the world until the dawn of, a, of the eternal ages, God has been working toward one grand event, one supreme end, the glorious wedding of his son, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, isn't that a, isn't that a powerful, powerful statement? It sums up the eternal purpose of the church age very succinctly and very powerfully. And God is inviting us with a fresh invitation. Here's what I want you to hear. God is inviting us with a fresh invitation to enter in to this divine plan that God had created even before the foundation of the world. Now, we've been invited before, and uh, we have said yes, and some have said yes, some uh, maybe have said yes and not put much energy into it. Some have put a lot of energy into it. But there's a, listen to me now, there is a fresh invitation going out, I believe, today to join in to this grand plan, enter into the eternal plan of the ages, to say yes to it, but not just to say yes, but to say yes in order to pursue it with all of your heart, all of your soul, everything that is within you. As we were driving to church today, Don and I, we usually spend that time praying for the service. Uh, and we were praying and she was praying. And one of the things the Lord reminded me of that I had not thought about was that I had this word maybe a year or so ago that from Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. And the word was that even the wise virgins had gone to sleep. Even the wise virgins had gone to sleep. It says that in, verse, in chapter 25. The, the foolish ones obviously were asleep, but even the wise ones, the ones that were per, making themselves ready, had gone to sleep. And the word the, the Lord gave me at that time, it's time to wake up. Uh, and I think he brought that back and say, it's really time to wake up right now. There's an urgency in the spiritual atmosphere that says now is the time, get ready. Get ready. Now is the hour. Now is the time. There should be no more delay. It is now the time to get ready. I don't know what's happening in the world. Uh, I mean, you know, we try to, I was having a conversation with Howard before the service and we were talking, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with the whole situation with Russia. And we both kind of came to the conclusion, we have no idea what's really happening. Uh, but we do, I do know from the Lord, I know this from the Lord, there's an urgency in the spirit realm to get ready, to get ready. And I believe that he could be coming very, very quickly. A scripture verse, I was going to say this to the end, but I, and I might use it again, but a scripture verse the Lord has really put on my heart is Revelation Oh, here it is. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. The Lord keeps quickening that to me. It's an, ur it's an urgency. Blessed is the one who stays awake, wakes up if they're asleep and then stays awake and it, actively pursuing making themselves ready. It's an, urgent, it's an urgent call, I believe, from the Lord. Um, the Lord gave me and gave Therese a prophetic word to that effect. And I'm going to get Therese to come on up and share. Uh, she shared it a couple of weeks ago in, in the amplified version. I've asked her to share it in more of the uh, abbreviated version. What she said was great, uh, but just the, the real point of that, because it so fits in with what the message is for today. I thought I got out of it. Um, <laughs> okay, footnote version. Uh, when Brian preached on Noah that Sunday uh, during praise and worship, I was back in my own little world like I always am. And the Lord just showed me a picture of Noah's Ark. And then he showed me Randall like 
a representation of Noah. And he said to me, your sons have taken a wife. Uh, you need to get ready. And I felt like the Lord was saying we need to get ready as a bride gets ready for her wedding, you know, spiritually, mentally, physically, everything, financially. I just think of all that they're doing back there, getting ready for this wedding. The Lord was saying, you need to get ready. Like, you need to get ready because it's coming. And so our children have always been a picture of the, what's going on in the church. So we need to get ready. <laughs> yeah, amen. Amen. Now, Trace, let me ask you a question. Uh, you got that on that Sunday during the worship, though, right? Before? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, okay, say that. Bo say the that. Bible. <laughs> 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 the Sunday before Brian taught on Noah. So when he got up here to talk about Noah, I was like, whoa. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, put the line down there. It'll be fine. Okay, now, the reason I want, one reason I want her to share that is that very same Sunday morning, that very same day, during the worship, this was before, now I wanted her to make sure we heard that point. She got that before Brian taught on uh, his teaching that day. And I got this on that same uh, day, very, during the worship, before Brian taught. He, Brian had asked us to wait on the Lord. And this is what I heard. This year, this is 2022 for those that are, will be watching online. This year is to be the year of a true betrothal to the Lord. Get in a bigger font here. Uh, this is the year of a true betrothal to the Lord and all that is involved in it. The tinium, the ketubah, the dowry, etc. And, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. This year we must accept the betrothal. We must accept the betrothal and pursue bridal garments, putting on bridal garments. He then quickened in my spirit the message to the church at Sardis, uh, which I might get to uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But the church at Sardis was that they had a reputation that they were alive, but they weren't. And he says, I have not found your deeds uh, satisfactory yet. And he called them to wake up. And the scripture verse that I read just a minute ago from Revelation 16 was pretty much a paraphrase of some of the things that were in the church message to the church at Sardis. Okay, that that was the first. That was on I think February the sixth. I'm not sure what the exact date. But then on February 23rd, uh, I heard this. This is a year to wake up to our betrothal, to take it seriously, and to begin or intensify, hear this part here, either to begin or intensify a lifelong pursuit of making ourselves ready. A lifelong pursuit of making ourselves ready. So this is what I believe the Lord is saying to us prophetically. And we'll get into the teaching part here in just a minute. But I believe what he's saying to us prophetically is that we've been betrothed to Christ as his bride, betrothed. But now is the time that we need to put a, 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 a real focus, a real intensity into our preparation process to make ourselves ready to be the eternal wife of the Lamb. Uh, there's a difference between being betrothed and being the eternal wife of the Lamb. And we'll talk about some of that. But the time is now. There's, no, there's an urgency. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't really know why the Lord keeps giving me these kind of messages. But the last, this one and the last two before that have been messages about the urgency of the hour and the need to prepare. Uh, the first one that I did was uh, fear God and no one else. Don't make any decisions based on fear or based on what the pressures of the world might say. Fear God and be obedient to him. That doesn't mean you don't ever do anything the government says, but we need to pray about those things to make sure that we fear God and we don't make decisions based on what the government or, or the pressures of the world might lead. We fear God and we fear no one else. Because there might become a time, there will come a time, where some of the things that we're being asked to do will be anti-God. And the Lord wants us to fear Him 
and not fear what others might pressure us to do, those in authority. And then he, this, the next message he gave me was prepare the people not to deny my name. Prepare the people not to deny my name. Because they might, there very well could be in our lifetime pressure to deny the name of God, the name of Christ. And I use uh, John 14, 6. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And the pressures are going to be, there's many ways, there are many truths. And the consequences are going to come that if we don't accept one of those many ways or many truths, there will be consequences of that, persecution and who knows what else. And he says, prepare them not to deny my name so that he will confess us before the Father if we confess him as the way, the truth, and the life before others. Those are the, you know, I mean, those are not bless you messages, but they're, but they're preparation messages to prepare us for what might be coming, which I, I don't really know what is coming. All I know is what the Lord, I believe the Lord is saying, be ready, be ready, get ready. And this message is to, along those same lines. It is time to enter into the, to the plan of the ages. It is time now to enter into the plan of the ages. No more delay. No more delay. Amen. Can you say amen? <laughs> Anybody want to tell a joke or anything before I move on here? Okay. All right. All right. Now, that is the prophetic word. Now, I want to talk a little bit now about the plan of the ages, and I want to use the, the ancient Jewish wedding uh, uh, process that uh, a young couple during the days of uh, where Jesus walked the earth would, uh, would use to, make, to, to enter into a marriage relationship. I think it'll be very helpful to, make, to, to give us a really a, a picture of what we need to do in terms of our marriage to Christ, to be made ready. Uh, so yeah, another thing that prophetically that I think is pretty interesting is that, you know, as a small church like this, you know, we probably haven't averaged even one wedding a year, probably, you know, since we started. And we've got four young couples right now uh, betrothed and uh, planning weddings for this year. Uh, and I thought that's, that's got to be a prophetic picture of what God is saying uh, to the, the church. But anyway, enough prophetic pictures. Let's, let's talk about uh, the, the, the Jewish wedding system and how that relates to our preparation uh, to be made ready for Christ and to be married to him. I've got seven steps. Uh, you know, when I wrote the Worthy Bride book, I only had five, so I've come up with two more steps. Uh, but uh, the... The, let me just summarize them. The arrangement of the marriage, the betrothal ceremony. The third one is the preparation period between the betrothal and the wedding ceremony. The wedding processional, the wedding ceremony, the wedding feast, and the couple living together to accomplish God's purpose uh, in their lives. Uh, so let's talk about, I'm going to talk about the arrangement of the marriage. That's the first step. The arrangement of the marriage. You are a product of an arranged marriage. That's God's goal for you, the, an, an arranged uh, marriage. Uh, Donna and I like to say that we were the product of an arranged marriage, and we were. God arranged our marriage. We had no idea about it. I wasn't even saved then uh, when we first when we got engaged, and uh, that wasn't the greatest of times because of that. But, we, but God somehow arranged us to be married, and we know absolutely that we were the product of an arranged marriage. Uh, but I want to digress. I want to talk about the arranged marriage between you and Christ. There are like four aspects of the arranged marriage. There's the tenium. There's the uh, wooing of the bride. There's the ketubah. Uh, and there's the dowry. Now, I'll, I'll explain those. But those are all important because we're talking about our need to make ourselves ready. Okay, the tenium, and I know I'm not pronouncing these words correctly. The tenium is the prenuptial agreement. Uh, those of you that are engaged right now, you are blessed in the sense that your dad 
is not picking out your mate. You get to pick them out yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, we always laugh. Stephen was the hardest one to, to find the mate for. And, uh, you know, I mean, I would go to Starbucks and say, Stephen, you know, there's this girl at Starbucks. You need to go down and meet her, you know. Or there's this girl at the bank. You need to go meet her. Uh, and he finally, God finally led him to that perfect one uh, for him. Uh, but, but the prenuptial agreement in the Jewish traditions, the parents of the bride and the groom would get together and they would make a plan on, you know, you need to, uh, to marry this person. And they would, they would maybe involve a matchmaker and that type of thing. Um, and so I'll talk more about it in a minute. But the tenium, there is a, there is a spiritual tenium. That's the prenuptial agreement. Before the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, in the council of the Godhead, they determined that Christ would have a bride. They determined that, Christ, that the eternal purpose of the ages would be for Christ to have a bride at his side for all of eternity. A bride who would be equally yoked, who would be made ready who would be his eternal partner. So there's a tinium that's been pro pronounced over your life. The product of an arranged marriage. You have been decided by your father that you are to be married to Christ. But then there was also not only the tinium, the prenuptial agreement, there was the wooing of the bride. So at the fullness of time, Jesus comes to earth and he does all these miracles, healing the sick and casting out demons and feeding the 5,000. See, for the wooing of the bride, even in the ancient Jewish traditions, even though the parents uh, had agreed that you're to be married to this person over here, that girl usually had the option to say no. I don't know if any of you have ever seen that movie, uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. It's a name. If you, if you raise your hand if you've seen Fiddler on the Roof. You know, it's matchmaker, matchmaker, find me a wife. You know, is that song they sing. And uh, Dad, his first pick is uh, some guy probably about my age that, uh, you know, she did not want to be married to. Uh, you, you know, so the girl had the choice. She could, she could reject that in most cases. Uh, so the groom would have to, betray, the, the, the one that wanted to be betrothed to her, he would have to come and woo her some and convince her that he was worthy of her marrying him. Uh, and so, you know, he would romance her and, you know, do the whatever they did to woo her back then. Uh, but that's what Jesus did. He came to earth to woo you to say, this is worth my giving my life to this man. He is worth it. He is worth it. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He fed the 5,000. And he promised that you will be married to me, you'll sit with me on your throne, on my throne for all of eternity, and you'll be my partner as we expand the kingdom throughout the earth, throughout the universe, forever and ever and ever. That's a pretty good woo, don't you think? Yeah. So he wooed her. He's wooed. Him. He's wooed you. But then there's the ketubah, uh, and the ketubah was a contract in an ancient Jewish wedding. Was a contract that established the terms and the conditions of the marriage between a, a young Jewish man and a Jewish young lady. The ketubah said, you know, I'll do this, 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 and this, and you do this, 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 and this. It set the, the expectations for the marriage. We have entered in to a ketubah with Christ. 
He presented the ketubah. When he came to earth and walked the earth for those three and a half years, he gave the Sermon on the Mount. He gave his, uh, all of his parables. Even Paul, who betrothed you to Christ, 2 Corinthians 11, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 11, I betrothed you to Christ. All of his teachings about the indwelling life and the fullness of Christ within coming forth, they're all part of the ketubah. The writings of John, really, uh, which record the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of John, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3, those are the ketubah. And, he, and it, basically he says, okay, I'm betrothing you. I want to betroth you to be my bride. Here's what I'm expecting of you to do, the ketubah. All the teachings that are in the scriptures. I am expecting you to live that way. It's not an option. It's not if you feel like you want to do it. You know, much of the American church teaches all, uh, teaches is so being obedient to the scriptures, being obedient to God's voice is just a suggestion. They say, well, he loves you. Well, he does love us. And he's wooed us and he's promised us all these things, but he has given us this ketubah and he's saying, okay, you've got to spend your life, you've got to agree to it, and then you've got to spend your life pursuing these things. This is the way you are to live. So that was the ketubah. We're still in the arrangement of the marriage. This one's going to take more time. I, I won't take this much time on all the steps. The fourth part, or the third part, third part is the, of the arrangement is the dowry, the dowry. The husband had to, the, the potential Jewish husband had to give a dowry to the bride's family. He said, okay, because you had to purchase a wife. That's what the, they use that term. You had to purchase a wife. Jesus gave the ultimate dowry his life. It took his life. It took his, it took his life on the dying on the cross. You know, Colossians uh, talks about this, to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, ransoming, ransoming us there. The blood of Jesus was the dowry that he paid that you might be his wife. This Thank him right now. Just, just, Lord, we thank you for that. And what a price you paid. Help us to be obedient to your ketubah. And then the fourth part of the arrangement was that the bridegroom would give a gift to the bride that was actually given on betrothal, at the betrothal ceremony. You know, it later became a, a ring, kind of like an engagement ring. But in earlier days, it wasn't so much. It could be uh, anything, I guess. Jesus gave you the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit given to you at your betrothal to dwell within you that this ketubah seems absolutely impossible to live out. You, you think I can live all these things that, that are in your writings and all this? And he says, well, the good news, I'm giving you a gift. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be your helper. He'll be your comforter. He will be the one where you say, Lord, I need your grace for this. This besetting sin, this stronghold in my life, this issue that I can't seem to get victory over, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit because your grace is sufficient. Your power is fulfilled in the midst of my weakness. It's made, it's made strong in my weakness. See, so he came and he gave us everything that we need to be a bride made ready for him. He gave us the tinium, the plan. He gave us the ketubah, the expectations. He gave us the dowry, the, the, his life, and he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit to help. It just, let's just say amen. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you're being touched by this, but it's certainly touching me. Okay, then there's the betrothal ceremony, the next step. After that, there was the betrothal ceremony. 
Let me say this. The new covenant, I, I, I did not see this until I went back through and studying for this class. The new covenant is a bridal covenant. It's a bridal covenant. Every step that Jesus went through to enter into the inner, to cut the new covenant is also a step that's involved in the, in the betrothal of a bride uh, to him, but also, you know, in the ancient Jewish system. It's a bridal covenant. Uh, and so when he came to earth, he did all the things that the bridegroom in an ancient Jewish wedding had to do. Uh, you know, he he executed the he followed the tenium, the prenuptial agreement, the ketubah, and, and all of those things. But at the betrothal ceremony, several things took, had to take place. One, two of note, really of note. The when they were entered into a betrothal ceremony, they both the bride and the groom had to go through a ritual bath before they had the, the, the betrothal ceremony. They had to be immersed in water. Um, they also both drank a cup of wine at the betrothal ceremony. So when Jesus, when Jesus came to earth and John the Baptist, uh, he wanted John the Baptist to baptize him, John said, you need to be baptizing me. But Jesus said, no, we've got to do it. This has to be done. Why? Because he was preparing himself to betroth us as his bride. And he had to go through the immersion in order to do that. And then they had to, both had to drink a, a cup of wine. The bridegroom at the Last Supper, he says, this is the blood given for you. He drank that cup of wine as part of the betrothal ceremony. And then when, when the bride did the same thing, but when we come to Christ, we are betrothed to him. At the point of salvation, we are betrothed to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, Paul tells us this. I betrothed you to to Christ. When, when we are betrothed to Christ and we enter into that betrothal ceremony, we have to be immersed in water. We have to be baptized by, in, in water. And every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we drink the wine, celebrating our betrothal to Christ. So we're betrothed to him. And that, that was initiated and explained by Christ coming to earth. And then the third step, though, of the seven is the preparation period between the betrothal and the wedding ceremony, the preparation period. Now, what would happen, and you can, you can look all this Jewish wedding uh, system up on the Internet and in books and things like that, so it's, it's well documented. But once they were betrothed, what would happen would be that the bridegroom would go to the father's house and would air, have a room and prepare a room uh, for them to live in at the father's house. And the bride would stay at her own home. And this period usually, la this time usually lasted about a year. Uh, the, and the bride didn't know the hour or, or the time. Now, even the bridegroom didn't know. The, the father of the bridegroom was the one that would eventually say, come and get your wife, come and take your wife. So they, were, they spent that year apart. He was adding a room to the house, and she was preparing her bridal garments, and she was being observed for her purity, those two primary things, observed from her purity. In the, in the situation of the ancient Jewish wedding, they were observing her to make sure that she wasn't pregnant. So there had to be at least, I guess, nine months uh, to make sure that she wasn't pregnant. So they were reserving her for, her for her purity, her faithfulness. And then she also had to make her bridal garments because there wasn't a bridal shop in those days. She had to make her wedding dress. But there's a, there is a spiritual 
parallel here. Now, this is really important. This is really important, so I want you to listen. We're being observed by the Lord right now during our life. This betrothal period lasts from the time we're born again until either we die or Christ returns, whichever comes first. That's what period of time we have that we have to make ourselves ready to put on our bridal garments and to be observed. And during that time, the Lord is observing us for our, for our purity. And, and we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ when we, when we go to heaven and we'll be evaluated based on the purity and the way we lived our life. And Brian was talking about this the other day in one of his messages, and I feel the same way. It's a frightening thing to think about standing before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of our life as it relates to purity. But we're being observed for that. And so the more we can come away from other lovers and other loves to where Christ is the only one, the importance that is. You know, one, it was interesting today. I had written my tithe check, and I put it, I always put it in my Bible uh, to carry it to church. And I just opened the Bible up to stick it in there, and it opened up. And normally I don't even pay attention to this, but it opened up to the front of a, the first page of a book of the Bible, an Old Testament book of the Bible. And I thought, I, first I didn't pay attention to it, then I thought, go back and look at it. And it was the book of Hosea. You know, and Hosea, you know, married uh, Gomer. It's kind of a little bit vague as all the details of it. But she was unfaithful to him. So there's a, there's a call to remove all unfaithfulness. Where, all, where other lovers and other loves surpass this love for Christ, where he is the only one for purity. And then she had to make her own garments. Now, Revelation 19, 7 and 8, 9 in there, we talk, that's a really important verse of Scripture, and we'll look at that in a lot of depth in our uh, Theology of the Bride class because it's probably the most important passage related to the bride making herself ready. But he said... The marriage of the, of the bride has come, and the bride, I mean, the, bride, the marriage has come, and the bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. She had, remember, the bride had to make her wedding dress during this preparation period. And at Revelation 19, the bride, the, the spiritual bride, the bride of Christ has made herself ready. This is right at the end of that period. But she had the whole time to make herself, to put on those bridal gar garments. Now, fine linen, we're not going to go into it for time reasons, but fine linen was the clothing that allowed the priest to enter into the presence of the Lord. You could not wear wool into the presence of the Lord. You could see that in other places in the scripture and in the notes here. The fine linen was the clothing that allowed the priest to minister unto the Lord. Ezekiel, four, uh, yeah, Ezekiel 44 goes into that. Bright and clean, bright and clean. That word bright is like a brilliant glory. It's, uh, it's uh, so white that it looks like, basically like the sun shining in brilliance. And clean, purity. So you got brilliance. She was clothed in brilliance and glory and purity in a way that would allow her to, to enter into and to dwell in the presence of the king. And those, those garments, were, it says right there, were the righteous acts of the saints. And we'll deal with it more in more detail in a, in a uh, next session, I believe, in our two sessions from now. But the righteous acts of the saints is not, okay, see how many works of righteousness I can do. You know, we talked about this in our home group last time. 
you know, a lot of us came out of those backgrounds where, okay, now you're saved, now go serve the Lord. Go do works of righteousness. Go, you know, serve in food pantries. Go do this, go do that. It's not that, not that. I mean, that may be what God calls you to do. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with all that. But the righteous acts of the saints, if you look at the detail of it, and, and I've got in the notes in a later session the explanation. If you look at the detail of all that, the righteous acts of the saints starts out with inward transformation. Inward transformation of your life. To take on progressively the image of Christ. Progressively in your life. And it flows from that to deeds of obedience. You know, you look at the, seven, the messages to the seven churches in Revelation, none of them say you need to go out and do more work. It means you need to be different in your own life. And you need to be obedient to the voice and the word of God. See, so she was given her life to clothe herself. I'm talking to the spiritual bride. We are given our life to, to clothe ourselves in spiritual garments of purity and, and, clean, and cleanliness and fine linen that allow us, spiritual linen that allow us to go into the presence of the Lord allow us to be close with him. That's, you know, and we're going back to our, the prophetic part. You've been given, you've been called or given opportunity to enter into the, uh, the plan of the ages. We are betrothed to Christ and this is how we enter in. You know, there's more, a lot more things in detail. This is how we enter in by making ourselves ready during this life that we have. So she was doing that, and then when the year came to an end, or whenever the father of the bridegroom said, go and get your, your bride, he would come from the father's house, and he would go, and he would go to the house of the bride, and there would be a processional there with many people coming, uh, w with him and they would fetch the bride and take her to the bridegroom's house and the, and the actual wedding consummation ceremony would be there. So there was a processional. Now, I, I, don't, I won't turn to the scriptures because of time, but if you look at Revelation chapter 19, verse, I think it's uh, maybe starting with verse 11 through about 15, 14, 15, as soon as the bride is made ready, Revelation 19, 7, 8, 9, 11, verse 11 begins, the heavens open up and Christ returns. And there's a processional. And that processional goes to battle against all of his foes and then it ends with the millennial kingdom and I believe the marriage supper of the Lamb is sometime in the midst of, of all that. So the heavens are opened up and the bridegroom comes. Who does it say is with him? It says, the armies who are dressed in fine linen are with him. The bride who has made herself ready. You know, Revelation 17, 14 uh, has a similar thing. You know, the Lord gets into this huge battle with the enemy, but the army that is with him are the call, the chosen, and the faithful. But many are called and few are chosen. Talking about, the, and we'll look at that as well, in some of the bridal paradigms of Jesus' teachings. And so this, profession, this processional, you know, there's, there's a little more clarity that we probably need in terms of the processional. But the processional, Jesus doesn't just come down to the Mount of Olives and go immediately uh, into Jerusalem. There's a processional where he defeats his arm, the armies of the Antichrist and the, and the armies and, and brings judgment. There, I don't know how long it lasts, what, it, what all's involved in it. But I know I would have, I, that's been on my heart for a year or so. I really want to be a part of this processional. We'll be in glorified bodies. You know, we'll be with Christ as he defeats all his enemies. Well, it, wouldn't that be exciting? I mean, don't you want to be a part of that? You don't sound too excited about it. Just say, yeah, yeah, I want to be a part of that. I want to be, I want to be a part of this processional. 
So it's the wedding processional. And then there's the, the wedding ceremony, going back to the steps. The wedding ceremony. This is where the, uh, the final marriage event takes place at the house of the father. They get, they get married and then they consummate the relationship uh, and then there's the marriage supper of the lamb. Now when, listen to me now, when the bridegroom goes to heaven to prepare a place for his bride, he's not, you know, King James I think says I prepare a mansion for you. He's not preparing you a mansion. That's not even the word. He's not even preparing you a, a nice little house out in the, the beautiful gardens of, of heaven. He's preparing, listen to me now, he is preparing for you a place in the new Jerusalem. That's the house he's providing for you. It's the new Jerusalem. But who will be there? Who will be dwelling in the new Jerusalem? The bride who has made herself ready. Not every believer will dwell there. Now, I believe we'll have access. Every believer will have access to it. But I want to dwell there. The church at Philadelphia, you'll be a pillar in my temple in there. You know, the name of the new Jerusalem will be written on your forehead. But that's the church that he had nothing against. So that marriage takes place. The marriage supper of the Lamb occurs. And then the couple lives together as husband and wife for the rest of their life in the Jewish system. And for us, for the bride who has made herself ready, there we live together as the eternal partner of Christ forever and ever and ever. As he ever expands his kingdom throughout the creation, throughout the universe. This quote that I read from Paul Bilheimer says it all. For ever increasing, as the kingdom is expanded, the bride who has made herself ready, the bride who has made herself ready will dwell with Christ. Oh, man. Oh, I want that. I know you do, too. You want, do you want that? I mean, do you want that? Yes. We want it. Everybody wants it. Okay. But listen, all of us have to wake up be alert and make that a focus of our lives. You know, I tell the Lord that, you know, I won't say daily, but a lot. Lord, I want to be your bride. I want to be, I want you to help me to get ready. And then I see, Lord, I see my flesh and self-life. And I say, oh God, help me, help me, help me. But the, the point is, we ha you know, so none of us are there yet. I don't want anybody to even think that I'm coming from the standpoint that I'm already there and I'm just telling you to get there. I'm, I'm on the journey just like everybody else is. But here's the, here's the point, and the point of the prophetic nature of that word, is now God is saying there's an urgency right now. You cannot delay any longer. You have to give your life to that, to that act, act, to that pursuit. And so I'm, I'm really, I, I, I plead with you, do not just go and leave, forget this message and don't give any attention to this. Make it a moment in time where you say, okay, I haven't given, if this is you, I haven't given a sufficient energy into making myself, ready, making myself ready. And I say to you today, Lord, I will do that. It has to be a focus of your life. It has to be something 
that's in your conscience on a, on a daily or regular basis, you know, you have to allow the Holy Spirit, that gift of the Spirit, to bring up things that, okay, this is, you need this. You need that. He's doing it in love because he wants you to, to have the ultimate partnership with him forever and ever and ever and ever. And so what he wants us to do, the response for today is to say, Lord, I, I want to wake up and I want to be alert. You know, that church, that message to the church at Sardis. Some were clothed with white and white garments. But the others had a reputation that they did, but they didn't really have the white garments on. And he says, okay, I'm going to come at a time you don't know, like a thief. And he said, you get ready. That's, that's my paraphrase of it. And so what he's saying is wake up if you're asleep. If you're not asleep, be alert. You can use that word wake up to the message of the church of Sardis also means alert. It's the same Greek word that's used in the parable of the ten virgins where he said be, al be on the alert. But he's saying, I believe in the spirit, he's saying the times are urgent. Now is the time. Now is the time. There's, time, there's no more time to delay. Make yourself ready. And so that's my challenge uh, to myself as well as to everyone here and everyone who's listening online as well. So anyway, let's stand up and I just want to have a prayer for you, um, for us, all of us. And even those that are online. Father, I thank you for I thank you for the invitation that you've given to us to enter into the plan of the ages. And Lord, I, I say yes to it. I say yes. And Lord, my prayer is that everyone here, here in person and here online, will also say yes. That's my cry. Lord, we pray, that, we pray that no one would take it lightly. I know that if we take it lightly, we'll not be ready. I, I know that is true in the spirit. And so, Father, that's my, none of us can make ourselves ready. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit, the gift that was given to us at our betrothal. But I know we have to nurture that gift. So God, it's my prayer for all of us that we would today say yes. We say yes to you, Lord. Make us ready. Make us ready. By the grace of God, that is our desire. Just tell him, Lord, if this, if this is you, just tell him, I want you to just make it out loud. Just say, that, Lord, that is my desire that you make me ready. If you, and I'm willing to be cooperative. I'm willing to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. That's my desire. And I want you to just voice it to the Lord uh, in your own words. Lord, I want to be made ready. I want to be your eternal wife. I want all of those things. And so make me ready. One thing I wanted to say, he's not asking us to do more for him. He's just saying, listen to me, enjoy me, and be obedient as I, as I lead you on this journey. There's a great joy in it. It's not a wait. Just like, just like the couples that are engaged Right now, look over here at Kent and Katie. They were ready for their marriage coming up. June the 12th. 
I know, I always like to kid Katie about it. She thinks I'm doing their wedding and I always like to act like I don't know the date. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking forward to that. There's joy in it. And there's a lot of preparation. I bet Katie's been focused on preparing for this event. Have you been focused on preparing for this event? She has, yeah. She's focused on it. Uh, she is determined. Now, I, and that's good. That is good. But we need, to, we need that same kind of attitude on getting ready to be the bride of Christ. Amen. All right, amen. So I guess we'll end the uh, online version. version. Uh, you can be seated for a minute. I think we want to do a, at least one more thing. <clears throat>